Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's uh, a real honor to be invited for graduation uh, for any department. It's the, I think there are two great honors in what we do in academics, being named Teacher of the Year by your uh, residents or being invited to be a visiting professor for graduation is uh, kind of the highest uh, echelon. So it's really an honor for me to be here and so many friends that I have made over the years. So we'll share that. Um, so th this is the list of your prior speakers. It's a really impressive list of, and it's amazing to see how many uh, we've had of, at the same, at, for our graduation, Christy Weber, who was here in 2013, was just our um, uh, visiting professor last week, which is pretty incredible given it's her first, her year as the president of the academy, first female president, as you know, in 87 years, so that's fantastic. Um, and congratulations to you guys. Uh, this is a huge uh, week and huge event, and, and people outside of medicine don't understand necessarily what residency graduation is all about, uh, all the work that you put in and all the effort. And so to be able to celebrate you guys and, and celebrate this uh, event with you is, uh, is really a great honor. Um, I always think about, uh, we talk a lot about books that you should think about and put on your to-do list. If you don't have any of these, the, I, would, I would encourage you to, uh, to put these on your to-do list. Essentialism, critical, I'll talk about that a little bit through the day. Team of Teams is uh, Stanley McChrystal's book that, that talks about horizontal, um, uh, kind of the horizontalization of leaders and of groups as opposed to the vertical nature that we were traditionally set up to do in the military and in academic centers or in private groups. Uh, but the horizontal configuration gives people at the local levels the power and empowers them to do what they need to do. And Black Box Thinking is really a great book, if you haven't read it, uh, talking about uh, the aviation industry and how they've learned from their mistakes, i.e. the black box, and how medicine historically does not learn from their mistakes. Um, in fact, we hide our mistakes. m and conference, we don't share what happens at m and from one institution to another institution where we could all learn from it. So really uh, good, good uh, reads for you if you get a chance. Cody, thank you for picking me up and for being a great host so far. Uh, it's been a, a great uh, start of this uh, trip. So some facts to think about as we talk about edu education in 2019. We have increased restriction on work hours. We have increased bureaucratic responsibilities. We have tremendous increased societal and hospital pressures. And in many situations, decreased opportunities in the operating room. That is a really bad combination of events that are all coming together. Some observations and comments that I hear when I go around the country and talk to different departments. There's increased chasm between the generations. There's more us versus them. There's a general misunderstanding of millennials by all other generations. We'll talk a lot about that. There's concerns about the shift mentality from the faculty and concerns about too much service from residents. So we've got a lot of con con uh, conflicting problems going on there. Uh, loss of graduated responsibility, financial pressure on faculty to bill, which was never there 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Privatization of teaching hospitals. We have an absence of defined curriculum of, of the core general orthopedic knowledge and the feeling from some that residents lack the ownership to actually own their education. So there's a lot of things that are going on. And here's my provocative concern. I don't think we've ever been at a more precarious time as surgical educators. How do we do what we do? How do we train the next generation, that, that group right there, with all of these things going on? So for the next 40 minutes or so, let's go through that and try to figure out where we can make impacts, where we can make changes, how we can, as individuals, perhaps, make the departments that we work in better, make the process and pathway better for our residents and fellows and medical students. So we'll start with work hour restrictions and how that's impacted training. We're gonna talk about educating the millennials and this is geared towards the faculty. We're gonna to talk to the residents about how to be a good resident fellow. And then we're gonna talk about evaluation and feedback and that's for all of us on how to improve our lives if we're in this education game, which we all are in. So historically, we had program directors like that guy who's gonna, after 24 years, hand over the reins. And they were resident advocates, and their goals were easy. It was to make the residency program the best in the country, and this is what Doug looked like a long time ago, and this is what he looked like six months after he was a program director. 
and you have increased bureaucratic responsibilities, you've become a box checker, we have more burnout. The fact that Doug lasted 23 and a half years is remarkable because today's age, the, the residency director burnout has never been higher, ever. We talk about doctor burnout, but residency director burnout dwarfs uh, medical doctor burnout. Uh, and the question that comes up is, does the ACGME even care if you guys are good doctors? Or did we just check the boxes and make sure that we've highlighted all the things that we had to highlight? And then we're gonna trans, you guys are gonna transition uh, in uh, July. And so we'll, it'll be an exciting time for the residency, uh, but it's also daunting because now they're worrying about how they're gonna live up to, uh, to Doug's shoes. Uh, so how did we get work hour restrictions? What happened to the good old days? You know, every other night call, the only problem with that was that you missed half the good cases, right? That's the, what you hear from the senior faculty. So this is the, where it all started. It started in my current place of, of living, New York City. Uh, Libby Zine was an 18-year-old female. She arrived at New York Hospital, which is now known as NYP Cornell. In 1984, she had a fever and mysterious jerking movements, and she was admitted to medicine. And remember, in those days, there were no faculty in the emergency room. So she was admitted to her, pri her family's private physician service who never saw her, never evaluated her. It's an important part of the story. She w this is what we know. This is part of the legal and medical record. She was on Nardil for depression. It's an MAO inhibitor, and she was prescribed Demerol. And that was suggested by the family MD who served as her attending, and that was approved by the second year resident, who now think about this, the second year resident is the senior most person involved in the care of this patient. The intern had admitted her, and she, the intern's getting all of her information from the PG2 who's across the street. Around 3 a.m., she was agitated. The intern was called and ordered Haldol and physical restraints, never saw the patient because she was so busy in the uh, ICU taking care of 40 patients. The PG2, again, was not there, getting some rest across the street, and the attending has never seen this patient. So just think about all of those details, because that this is the genesis of our 80-hour work week. And it's incredible that this case served as the sentinel event. At 6 a.m., her temperature rose to 170, to 107. They did the emergent attempts to cool, and she went under, uh, underwent cardiac arrest and unfortunately died. So those are all the facts. There's nothing disputed about that. Uh, what wasn't publicized is that she came to uh, the hospital from a party. There was cocaine use that was implicated, although denied by her father. And the cause of death to this day is still debated. Was it serotonin syndrome? Was it a drug overdose? It remains a bit unclear. Her father was Sidney Zion, a very grieving father, as you might imagine, former prosecutor, former uh, prominent journalist, and had a lot of ties with the DA's office, uh, Mr. Morgenthau, who just turned 100. They celebrated a party the other night. Uh, and so he went to the grand jury seeking murder charges against the physicians and the hospital. Pretty um, amazing, and he died in uh, 2009. The grand jury dismissed all the charges, but they issued a, a report that was really critical of the hospital, as you might imagine, given the facts as I've outlined them for you. The malpractice case was in 1994. It actually assigned equal blame to the hospital and to Libby Zion for concealing the cocaine use, and there was a, a small settlement that uh, Mr. Zion uh, was quoted as saying it was a tra travesty of justice. Well, that led to Bertrand Bell, who was the chairman of internal medicine at Albert Einstein, to be commissioned by the state to investigate this. And after 18 months <coughs> of investigations, what was the conclusion? That the residents were overworked and sleep deprived. It took him 18 months to figure that out. That was about in the first day, right? So that's not a, a very impressive uh, conclusion. In 1989, the 405 rules were recommended uh, and implemented in New York way before it came to the rest of the country. But the one thing that Bertrand Bell talked about is that supervision was more important than duty hours. That's in his official report. But the 24-hour work rule and the 80-hour work rule came out of that because it was easier to mandate work hours than it was easier to mandate supervision. So just think if there was a different tact at that point. If there was some way that we could have said, boy, we need to mandate supervision better, it may have totally changed the face of this. And so that led to, as we all know, the eight-hour work week. Uh, the questions that you should have that I have when I review this case and think about this as the history of the eight-hour work week is, did this patient's death have anything to do with work hours? Was this death due to fatigue by a, a single intern? 
Was this a supervision failure? Was this simply a negligence failure? What about the number of patients she was taking care of, 40 patients that one intern was being asked to care for without any supervision? Pretty, pretty uh, harrowing stuff. So the reality is it's really hard to mandate supervision and the easy path was to mandate work hours. Uh, the goal of the eight hour work week is certainly, uh, I think a good one, is to improve patient care, it's to improve residents' lives, increase opportunity for residents to read and be better prepared as doctors and surgeons. And there's absolutely no evidence of any of that being the case. Uh, so we know that there's numerous reports of increased errors due to increased handoffs. We understand there's quality issues with 80-hour work week, and we know as surgeons there's a concern about what is our surgical education as opposed to a pediatrician, a psychiatrist, internal medicine, nothing against any of those specialties, but surgery requires rep repetitions. It requires us having hands-on, and so there's certainly concern about that. Healthier work-life balance, you guys have a great work-life balance. You like to throw babies, I like that picture, John. John, that's a nice one. Uh, so I think that there's certainly a good, uh, a much bigger attention towards work-life balance. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. Uh, results about increased reading, no evidence that in-training scores, board passing, or fund of knowledge has improved given the changes in work hours. And what has the impact been on surgical training? Uh, initially, there was real concern about failure rates in orthopedics when the first iteration of the work hour group from 2005 to 2011, we saw a double the rate of failing of the uh, written boards. In neurosurgery, we saw higher rates of failure, twice the normal rates in 2011. Uh, and has the 80-hour work week negatively or positively impacted our education and training? So this has uh, been looked at a lot of different ways. 40% lack confidence in surgical skills, including 23% of graduating residents. This was from 2013. This is a little bit frightening. This is general surgery uh, questionnaire, 63% response rate, which is pretty good. 21% of fellowship directors at the end of a general surgery fellowship felt that the fellows were unprepared, they lacked patient ownership, and two thirds felt they were incapable of operating for 30 minutes unsupervised. This isn't from like you know, 40 years ago, this is from 2013. So these are real concerns about what's happening. We, did, we published a study back in 2014, looking at program directors and residents, and found in general people uh, had mixed views of the 80-hour work week and of the rule changes that we've all faced in graduate medical education. Uh, this was a systematic review in 2000, from 2010 to 2013. The conclusions, there was no improvement in patient care, no improvement in resident well-being, and an unintended negative effect on resident education. So really the, not, the unintended downstream consequence, especially for surgical education, I think had, hadn't been fully thought of. Uh, and now with electronic health record, look at, you know, how does that impact us? This is incredible. Duke General Surgery Program, median of 2.4 hours a day spending time on the electronic health record for 23.7 hours per week. One third of intern usage came outside of the shift and that leads to significant underreporting of work hours. So the EHR, again, meant to be a good thing for us has really been a, a big problem across the country. Uh, what about sleep? This is gonna be no surprise to any of you. We looked at three groups, gen, surge, and ortho were group one. They worked the most, they slept the least, but there's no difference in burnout or well-being compared with the rest. And what about gender differences? Female residents report working more and more burnout, poorer psychological well-being in the general surgery res uh, residency program. So a lot of issues to consider about what's currently happening in our educational um, arena. Autonomy. Big issue, right? You guys, the, the PG1s, all you want is the sharp, dangerous thing in your hand, and everybody else is wondering, can we let you have the sharp, dangerous thing in your hand, and when can we have that? And faculty feel residents should have decreased autonomy compared to the residents. 47% of residents felt they have little, too little autonomy. The public, mind you, is not in favor of residents having any autonomy or having resident involvement in their care. They don't want residents involved, and they don't think resident involvement will improve patient care, not understanding how the mentorship works with uh, physician training. General surgeries had to add an entire fellowship on transition to practice to add more time so that you can actually get better surgical education. Think about that, you're gonna actually have a fellowship just to operate more because you're not getting enough reps during residency. And we now know that just like year eight, 98% uh, of our graduates around the country are going into fellowships. 
and a significant number are doing two fellowships. Are any of you guys doing two fellowships? No? Okay. That's unusual. When I talk to residents now, it at is, least... It is becoming more... At least, at, at least one in almost every group is doing two fellowships. So one of my six graduates is, is doing two. Uh, I asked Vin Pellegrini in my role as, uh, as JOS Editor-in-Chief to do a, a, a guest um, uh, invited article on uh, education. And this is some of the, the thoughts he thought about. That th th if you looked at Gen Surge training, we went from 24 months to 12 months to six months to five months to three months. So we took all of that general surgical education that used to be a lot of hands-on when we were doing open coles and open appies and you got a lot of good skills and we basically eliminated that, right? We know Gen Surge doesn't exist anymore. It's a lot of laparoscopic stuff. It's become less and less germane for surgical education for orthopedics. The proliferation of subspecialty rotations has led to decreased time and reps in each domain, and billing and compliance and regulatory issues have led to decreased surgical autonomy, decreased dictations, decreased kind of being the doctor. Uh, and so in some ways, the 80-hour work week was the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of these things that have been coming along. So what are some solutions? Well, you can increase the training duration. That's been tried and failed at several different residency programs. Um, you can try to move more towards a competency-based curriculum, which Ben Allman really promoted very nicely at Toronto, has tried to do it at Duke. The problem with competency-based curriculum is what happens when you finish in three weeks? as opposed to eight weeks, then what do you do with those other five weeks? The system isn't really gelled for us to very easily, quickly put you into a different uh, rotation. Uh, we could eliminate non-educational aspects of residency training. I think everybody's trying to do that and be you know, much more education than service. The fourth year of medical school has become a waste of a year, right? We're doing four months of orthopedic rotations. Uh, and so perhaps that should be the start of our residency program. Uh, some, some programs like NYU and Duke have start initiated programs where they're accepting people into their uh, medical school already accepted to orthopedic residency. So they're already doing that and eliminating one year of medical school. So that may be an uh, uh, issue. And then simulation, which is so critical to what we do, but it's gotta be cost effective efficacious, and have durability. Every study ever published on simulation shows that there's a very short term benefit, but if you don't continue that skill, it's almost lost completely the next time you go back to do the simulator. So it can't be something where you just do it during boot camp as an intern and then never do it again. It's not gonna work. All right, so now we're gonna shift to educating the millennials. How do you teach this next generation of orthopedic surgeons and how do we evaluate residents' performance? And I'm gonna challenge the faculty. Have you changed your teaching style in the past 20 years, the 10 years, five years, one year? Um, have you, do you still go up to this podium, wherever you guys do your core curriculum, and speak to the residents and give a didactic talk as part of your core curriculum? Because if we are, if that's what we're doing, we're probably missing the boat, because that's not how these guys learn. And it's important to understand that as we continue to try to be better educators. I also ask um, the leadership, what criteria are used to hire a new faculty member for an academic institution? Uh, and think about what is used. Uh, but do we know if they can teach? Do we know if they can operate? Do we know if they can orate? Do we know if they are good educators at all, if they aren't part of our own system, if we're hiring people from outside? Um, teaching ability, the desire or background is the least likely attribute to be used in the final decision making for all the, the variables that we think about, but probably important. So what is a millennial? And we're gonna talk about some strategies for teaching millennials and then putting that all together. All right, raise your hand if you've been born between 1982 to 2000. Okay, so there's the millennials for you. Uh, this is the digital age, cell phone, iPads, portable, the most diverse generation to teach and you guys are not passive learners. You are not passive learners, that's critical. Traditional approaches to teaching may not address the learning preferences of this generation. So we have, an we have a choice. We can either change to, make, to correlate with how you guys learn or we can keep doing it the same way and then complain that you're not learning because of the way we're teaching. There's two choices, there are not many other choices. This is actually true, this is a Google search. I just did it last week, this is real. I didn't make this up. So millennial myths, folklore, etc. I, I swear to God, I didn't. I did not Photoshop that. Okay. 
So debunking those millennial myths. Want constant praise, feel entitled, obsessed, et cetera. So want constant praise. Recent studies show that all they want are bosses who are fair, transparent, consistent, dependable, and only 29% they were looking for praise for their accomplishments. Entitled, which is probably the number one thing that you guys hear. If you don't hear it, they're saying it. Um, no evidence whatsoever, but much more likely to speak up for themselves or others, even to superiors, and they're not af afraid to ask for promotions or raises, which is good. You should, you should be your best advocate. Why wouldn't you want to be your best advocate? Uh, technology obsession. You guys did grow up with technology, and you're more used to it. 39% prefer face-to-face -face communication over text or email, so there's still some hope that the affective domain and interpersonal communication has a place in the future. Lazy, this is the absolute one that's been debunked more than anything else. You work smarter, not harder. Uh, you deplore inefficiency and bureaucracy, and you strive to do more in less time. Good, good for you. You should continue to do that. Uh, but it has nothing to do with laziness. The one thing I do know is that there is more, and I tell this to young faculty who get frustrated, there is more, con you have to be a bit more concrete with some groups of millennials than others, meaning that what you take for granted might be um, inferred as to what needs to be done is not always the case. So you guys see that even as chief residents and interns. Uh, so there does have to be more transparency, more communication, and I think that's fine. And that usually just sets the stage for uh, what you want to happen. Uh, lack social media etiquette, uh, that one's been debunked pretty much all, all along. Failure to understand the other side is probably the most critical part of this part of the talk because it leads to faculty discontent. You hear about spoon feeding, lazy, don't get it, when I was a resident, all that stuff. And then that just kind of breeds this us versus them potential uh, chasm that doesn't need to exist. It's bad. So how do you teach them? Here's some general tips and pearls and, and some OR pearls that I hope you find helpful because I think that they're very uh, good to consider. Uh, and then this I just have to always talk about because there's a bunch of faculty out there who think that these are like the tools of the devil. And whether you think they're the tools of the devil or not, until proven otherwise, this is what residents and medical students are using. Uh, so you either figure out to do something better or you just recognize that this is what many, 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 many most are using at some point. The academy kind of gave up the education platform. They're trying to get back into the education platform. We'll see what happens. But for the time being, this is what people are using. So these are the five R's. So research-based methods. Uh, the millennials prefer a variety of activity learn learning left methods. If they're not interested, the uh, attention shifts. Uh, preferred learning is less lecture, use of multimedia, and collaboration with peers. Group learning is much more uh, uh, viewed positively. Relevance, Google has changed the world, right? We can look up on our phone anytime, anywhere, and so that changed how we prepare necessarily, it changed how we read, and the professor's role has shifted during this generation from dispensing information to teaching how to apply the information. And so our challenge for all of us in whatever role you have is to connect the course content to the current culture and make those outcomes relevant. The rationale, the boomers uh, were raised in authoritarian style. You told them what to do, they did it. No questions asked. Yes, sir, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Accepted the chain of command. Millennials were raised in the non-authoritarian style, more likely to accept policies if they understand why. Tell me why, I need to understand. So that takes a little bit more work on the mentor's role. Relaxed, prefer less formal learning environment, laid back, quote unquote, used by millennials to describe their ideal learning environment. Um, thrive better if professors, their mentors, show similar interest in their lives, given their relationship difference with your parents compared to previous generations' relationship with their parents. And this is the classic learning pyramid. If you've never seen it, uh, it's shown all the time. But this is the classic learning. You learn about 10% from lecture, and you retain 10% uh, from lectures and reading, 75% from practice doing, and 90% when you can then teach the junior resident or teach the other person how to do it. So much different between trying to sit here passively being dis uh, as opposed to being active. And avoid didactics. So this is our conference room at Columbia. It's not dissimilar from here. This is what it used to look like, and I, we don't do that anymore. Uh, this is my core curriculum. I had anterior, inst I had instability was my topic on February 10th. We take the chairs and put them in a circle, and that's the only PowerPoint right there, two x-rays. So as an educator, much harder. I don't have a script. I don't have a PowerPoint. 
I have to be able to now direct the questions to the level of the learner. PG1 is going to get basic anatomy questions. PG5 is going to get much more advanced questions. Fellow is going to get different levels. So it's harder for us. But I'll tell you one thing, the residents and fellows come to that lecture, quote unquote, much more prepared than they do to a straight didactic where there's no interactivity. They know I'm going to ask on every one of them. So they prepare, they read, they get more out of it. But it's harder. Uh, reality of modern medicine, there's a focus on efficiency, volume, surgeons doing the surgery. This is where it all started, the uh, spotlight um, story in the Boston Globe on two th in uh, December 2015 from MGH, as you guys know, and this led to widespread furor about double rooms and, uh, and ghost surgery. Uh, our, uh, that came out on 12 uh, 19 on 12 21. My uh, CEO, Steve Corwin, called an emergency meeting of all of the chairs and said, What the hell is our policy on this? Uh, and we said, We don't have a policy on this. And so we got a policy within about 48 hours. And this is the policy. Uh, so this is on every HP and this is on our consent form. It explains what overlapping surgery is, it explains what the roles are, it explains who will be participating in their surgery. And I've never, since we implemented that, have a, had a patient not sign this. As so long as they understand it, understand what that means, I will be there. I run two rooms every Wednesday. I do between eight to 10 surgeries. And uh, I've never had anybody not uh, sign that. But it is a big issue. Uh, we know that uh, practice makes perfect, right? Uh, so Gladwell gets the credit for the 10,000 hours, but it actually predated Gladwell. Uh, Colvin and Erickson talked about it. And Erickson studied 20-year-old violinists, and that's really where this came from, finding that the best group averaged 10,000 hours. Uh, that's a lot of hours of surgical training, guys, right? So what are our barriers to autonomy in the OR? We've talked about this. Increased advances in technology, subspecialization, increased uh, emphasis on efficiency and patient safety, volume, volume, volume. That's how we're making up the difference in the lower remuneration per case. And there's increased pressure on the surgeon to do their actual surgery and not have residents or fellows do it. So here's a good way to try to think about the surgery. This is a Zwish model, comes from Gen Surge. It was in 2013. But the four stages are show and tell, smart help, dumb help, and no help. And ultimately, you guys hope over there are the no help group, we hope, as you leave here. Uh, so here's the show and tell. The attending does the majority of the case, but what's different in this model is you've got to get the attending to buy in that they need to talk about what they're doing. They need to share their decision making of why they're doing that step and when they're doing that step and what they're doing to make that step look easy, as opposed to silently doing their surgery, which is what happens to lots of us. We get in our zone and you don't necessarily do that. But if you want to have ed surgical edu uh, residents and fellows, this is really critical. And the res Residents serving as a first assist and cues to advancement is when the first assistant begins to actively assist. In other words, when you start to know what the next steps are, you're demonstrating, I'm not just sitting here waiting to cut between the, the tines. I actually am understanding what this procedure is and now I can move on. Smart help now, the attending is shifting between the surgeon and first assist role and leads the resident, so actively assisting, demonstrating key concepts, anatomy and skill. The resident's doing all of that and they're shifting their role to a higher level of surgical participation. Cues to advancement, you can execute majority of the steps of procedure with active assistance. Then dumb help is now the attending is really being a passive assist. Okay, and you guys are taking on the major role here and you can set up and accomplish the next step for the entire case, demonstrate ability to do key parts of the case with supervision, recognize critical transition points, and the key cue to advancement here is you can transition between all those steps with passive assist from the faculty. And then no help is when you guys are doing it, where we can be in the back table just hanging out and watching you uh, magically do the surgical procedure. Uh, this was a prospective study on OR teaching, and it basically, it measured teaching behaviors of surgeons who were unaware of the study objectives and provided confidential individual feedback. Uh, the goal was to develop standardized pre-op and post-op debriefings. And basically, the, the concept here is uh, to think about what happens to us as surgical educators in the operating room. So if you looked at the briefings, we did a patient history, knowledge, past experience, technique, and potential problems. After the case, you then said to the resident, uh, you asked the, how the case went, asked what was learned, asked how to improve, gave feedback. Oh my God, we're going to give feedback in real time, not at the end of a rotation. Stated what went well and stated what, what you could do better. 
So this is an immediate feedback loop, and this had dramatic improvement uh, in the three groups. So all you had to do was just talk to the resident, talk to the learner, and all of a sudden their performance improved, their retention of the material improved, pretty dramatic and very easy to do. You could implement this tomorrow and not lose any sleep over it. That was our graduation last week. So what do we do now? Orthopedic boot camp, you guys do this as well. Orthopedic educators course is mandatory for all my faculty, we'll talk about that. And residency education committee, which is really critical to evaluate the teachers, evaluate what we do, make sure that the faculty involved with resident education are actually providing education, not just asking for service from them. So simulators, we've got the little easy ones that are, don't cost a lot. We've got more expensive ones that cost a lot that again, I'm not sure that they're worth their price right now. We use the OrthoBullets Pass program. Now the ABOS has one. So some form of feedback that you can get as a, as a learner so that you in, in real time, you did a case with Dr. Chansky, he sends you a, a ping on your iPhone and you can immediately get feedback for how you did on that procedure. It's really helpful. It's critical as surgical trainees. Bottom line on teaching is don't say or think the following. When I was a resident, millennials don't like to work hard. Why are they so unprepared in the OR? I hate ortho bullets and view medi. Don't say that because it's not going to help you. But as educators, we need to adapt. And I think if you do, it makes your life better. So if for, as far as millennials go, it's a whole new world. Transparency and communication are critical, as I said. Surgical simulation's not enough. Don't say that it's the way we've always done it. And if you change, uh, your clinic and OR teaching can make your life better as the faculty, which is really important because you want the faculty to be happy just as much as you guys wanna be happy. All right, how to be a great resident and fellow. Uh, this is a two-way street. You can't expect that both sides know what the other is thinking. It takes work, but it's worth it, and the alternative really stinks. It really does. Uh, we go back to Halstead, a regimen and discipline, and that's where we got the name house staff because we never left the hospital. Uh, and education and sacrifice were the principles, and the male residents were discouraged from marrying because, God forbid, that would take away from the goal of being a doctor. These are the Columbia residents in 1966, 1967. You can see the incredible diversity of this group. But what is Im impressive of this is those six all went on to be department chairman later uh, in their career. So it was a pretty impressive group. And this is what our residency looks like today. It looks a lot different. Uh, and it looks very similar to your residency. So diversity is finally hitting orthopedics last, but hopefully not least. Where's Mary Kate? So what do you think is the it quality that makes a successful resident? What's the most important thing? This, there's no right answer. Drive and work ethic. Okay. So here's my top five. It's just interesting to think about it. So trust, own education, work ethic, interpersonal skills, and professionalism. Day one, this is my discussion I had with our interns last week. Your reputation is easily obtained and nearly impossible to get rid of. You guys know that, right? Resident gets a good reputation, they're afforded more latitude. Resident gets a bad reputation, same event, same different prism, they are not afforded the same latitude. Uh, and there may be no more important quality in what we do than trust. Think about our relationships, senior residents, junior residents, faculty, junior faculty, fellows, residents, uh, we're trusting each other that if you saw a patient and you said X, that X is correct. I, I checked the compartments. There is no compartment syndrome. Or I didn't check. Or I forgot to check and I can say that to you and not get myself into trouble. So increase autonomy, ownership of the patients, and treat people like they're the, your family. If you use those principles, we usually do well. So where's Prash? There he is. So residency hierarchy, so you know, think about it. As a senior resident now, as a PG-5, you're trusting the junior residents with your life and your reputation because they may be doing the frontline work. And so your relationship with them is critical for your ultimate success. So in the old days, residents were afraid to not know answers. We would never go into the operating room and say, I don't know, and we would have been horrified and thrown out of the Operating was terrible. But again, today things are always there and at your fingertips. And there's a potential to misinterpret this with apathy, don't care, millennial, as we've talked about. Uh, there needs to be accountability, transparency, and you shouldn't assume anything. Our residency education committee is where we take care of all of our residency 
uh, issues. The re our chief residents run it. Each residency class has a peer nominated representative, but all residents participate. And it's really a critical way to make sure that we're maximizing the educational pathway for us. Good rotations, bad rotations, et cetera. Now, work ethic is something you can't teach, Mary Kate. That's either there or not. Uh, early arrival, late departure, do the right thing, and hopefully you get national championships for your Seattle teams. Um, but this is the old school, right? These, these are the guys that had work ethic and you never had to mention to them about work ethic. Interpersonal skills and communication are critical uh, to what we do. Uh, the number one factor in medical errors are poor communication or lack of communication. It leads to bad patient care uh, and it leads to emotional stability or instability. Uh, five keys to communication. This is really important for you as you think about this. Find common ground, keep the communication simple to the level of your listener, uh, capture people's interest, inspire people, and stay authentic in all your relationships. Really important in what we do. And learn about millennials and understand their perspective. They're, they don't suck, you're just old and hate change. I love that, that comment. Uh, and as far as communication goes, you have to seek it out. If you don't have it as part of your culture, you need to understand it. You need to ask for it. You need to know, how am I doing? And if you don't know, that's a problem. Uh, professionalism, avoid social media. Pictures are a problem, as you guys know. This was a, a, a story from 2017. Harvard withdrew 10 acceptances for offensive memes in a private group chat in April of, before those kids were about to start their college career. And I just think of the New York Times rule. You guys know the New York Times rule? If you write an email or write anything in a chart, just make sure that it's okay if, if that was printed in the front page of the New York Times. Because if it's not, delete it really fast. It only gets you into trouble. Uh, the other three A's, attire, appearance, attitude, critical for us, right? Look how nicely dressed he is. <laughs> Looks great. Uh, identify early, Adam. Role, what is your role in the residency going to be? Are you going to be a leader? Are you going to be a chief resident? What kind of job do you want? Academics, employee model, private The junior residents need to be thinking about that as you're trying to uh, predict your future for fellowship. Uh, are you going to look for a top tier fellowship? Are you looking for a middle of the road? Are you looking for a lower tier? You had shorter hair there. Um, and think about who the most successful senior residents are. Are they mentors? Are they role models? Are they teachers? They're setting the standard for the rest. And remember the hidden agenda is something critical to what we have in what we do in life. And that is what you do is more important than what you say. People are watching. The interns, the juniors are watching that, that class uh, right now very carefully. They've been doing that for five years now. And you've been setting what the standard is, whether you know it or not. And that work environment that you've created is your legacy, hopefully a powerful and good one. Uh, residency size makes a difference, right? There's a, a lot of different sizes. You can go to a 14-person program, a two-person program. That changes the culture, changes the ambiance of our programs. Fellowship pursuit, this is what you guys are all dealing with now. The four is just matched. Uh, but you guys know that one good resident can start the pipeline and one resident can stop the pipeline just as quickly. You're not an individual, private, solo person here. You're an ambassador for the University of Washington. And you never can forget that because that's going to impact people behind you. Don't show up in the OR unprepared. Uh, dump responsibilities, mistreat those below you. Don't score in single digits on the in-training. It's never helpful for anybody. Uh, rising chief residents, don't spread yourself too thin. Elicit feedback from everyone. Make goals and hold yourself accountable. And don't forget your family as you guys get increased responsibility, which is really hard. The successful fellow, different role. Now you're walking that tightrope between attending and resident. And how do you become a great fellow for you eight thinking about this as you go to your next chapter? See one, do one, teach one. Write down every step of every case those first couple of weeks that you're in your new environment. You're at the top of your comfort level and all of a sudden you're gonna be at the lowest part of your comfort level in one short you know, week. It's incredible. But review every step prior to the OR. Understand the nitty gritty of these new attendings and how they do things. And the quicker you get ingrained in that, the faster you become a, um, a valuable member of the team. I understand you got Chris's book last year, uh, but you should be able to do the entire procedure in your mind before you're in the operating room. And when you can do that, then you can do the surgery uh, in much more efficiently. Dan Rue, who I brought to Columbia, uh, says this when he's teaching a fellow to do an ACDF. He tells him, write down every step of this procedure. And when you can do that procedure, 
uh, when you follow my script, not anybody else's, the second you go off script, he takes the knife away. That's not how I do it. You do it the same way I do it, and then you keep going. It's pretty powerful, because you know there's no mystery about that. Successful follow in the office, just understand how the attending does things and be their clone. That's what you're trying to do, is understand how to take care of patients the way they do. Uh, and the one minute preceptor is get a commitment, get a diagnosis, probe front line reasoning, teach general rules, provide positive feedback and correct errors. So this is in one minute when you're with a resident or fellow in the office, you can do this very quickly uh, and start to get uh, patient, or get uh, resident buy-in on how that works. Research, guys, you gotta pick something that you're interested in. It should be publishable and don't say you're gonna finish it when you leave because it will never get done. In 21 years, it's never gotten done. Lastly, we're gonna finish on evaluation and feedback. This is my pet peeve. End of year residency evaluation faculty meeting. Attending says, Eric Magnuson was terrible. Dr. Hanel says, did you talk to him? Attending says, no, because we don't like conflict. Right? We, we're, we're much happier to just say that the resident was terrible than to actually do something about it. So set goals and feedback. These are game changers, critical for the generational differences and will make your lives better. And be very concrete, as I've said. Don't assume anything. The orthopedic educators course, as I mentioned, this was last year. These are five of my young faculty that I send and every one of our faculty goes there. This is a total game changer for educators. And if you haven't gone there as residents or as young faculty, you absolutely should. Uh, the 50th annual course is in 2019. It's really good for residents as well. Uh, three scheduled meetings. Where's Corey, is he here? He's not here, okay. So. Corey's coming on to my rotation. Melissa's my office coordinator. She calls, she calls Corey and she schedules three meetings before he's even started the rotation. So the start of the rotation, the midpoint of the rotation, and the end of the rotation. This will change your life for residents and for faculty. It's absolutely critical. So what happens is we use the Bogard. Uh, this was Kevin Black when he used to run the orthopedic educators course. So we're gonna do background, opportunity, goals, evaluation, rescue, and deal. Background, we're gonna talk about what the clinical experience is gonna look like. We're gonna talk about reading for the cases. We're gonna talk about similar situations that they've either been in or haven't so we understand where he's coming from, he or she is coming from. We're gonna talk about what the opportunity is for this two month rotation. What's actually gonna transpire, what your opportunities for learning are, what your opportunities for performance are. We're gonna set goals, both educational and performance goals. Uh, and here's a, a good situation. Is Mario here? There's Mario. So Mario, what are your goals for this rotation? To do a revision reverse total shoulder from skin to skin and I'm a PG2, okay. I'm gonna say, let's narrow that goal a bit. And then Mario's gonna say, okay, I wanna get the patient in the room, I wanna get him properly positioned, I wanna get him prepped and draped and I wanna do the approach. I'm like, okay, that's something we can achieve. So we're gonna, you're gonna tell me what your goals are and then we're gonna modify based on what I think is reasonable. Evaluation, how are you gonna be evaluated? Observation, verbal, written feedback, performance criteria, how fast you are, is there speed involved, number of patients seen, accuracy, et cetera. And rescue, what is the bailout? When will I step in and when will you or when will he or she step back out? And then there's a deal at the end of this. We say, okay, are we on the same page? Yeah, we're on the same page. And then what about feedback? Because the feedback part of this is critical. Constructive, it should not be at the end of the rotation only. Curbside is fine, so it's good to have informal feedback, but there should be a formal feedback as well. And then that's when Pendleton rules come into play. This was adapted from a British marriage counselor. It formalizes the feedback. It's completely non-threatening. You guys have, anyone here use Pendleton rules? Have you ever heard of these? Okay, they're very easy. This is what they are. I sit down with you, Mary-Kate, and I say, what went well? And then I tell you what went well from my perspective. And then I ask you, what could you have done differently? And then I tell you what you could have done differently. I mean, that's how easy it is. This could be 30 seconds, it could be 30 hours. It depends on how the, the rotation went. But they're very helpful for uh, helping change things. So does this really work or is this just talking about it up here at the podium? So I sat down last week with my end of the rotation residents and sat down with the start of the resident ro rotation residents and we did this exact thing. Uh, I've benefited greatly from this. My faculty who use these techniques have benefited. Friends and colleagues who I've mentored around the country have benefited from this. And the Orthopedic Educator course is in its 51st year and it sells out every year. So uh, it, it definitely does work. So the, that's been our overview. The summary of education for 2019, it takes a lot of work. Majority of differences are perspective and generational. There's a lot of concern of service versus education and we have a lot of work to do there. Uh, it's important to get residents to own their education. I don't know if it's again or not. And operative education is really hard work. What we do is not easy to train surgeons 
for the next generation. But don't forget, this is our ultimate goal, is to train you guys as the next generation of leaders. Uh, and this was our graduation last week, as I mentioned. So it's an exciting thing that we do. Uh, we're passionate about it, but we just have to make sure we're doing everything we can. So I'm just gonna finish off with a couple of fun things. So personal statements that we write to get into residency program, I, I break, break down into typical, those are the boring ones, and memorable, that where you might be talking about at the water cooler the next day. All right, so I ultimately hope for a career in academic orthopedic surgery, attaining a harmonious balance between clinical or blah, 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 blah. Who do you think that was? You guys remember over there? <laughs> you didn't remember that, did you? Uh, I was first drawn to orthopedics by my undergraduate coursework in biomedical engineering. My passion for sports led to an interest in biomechanics, inspiring me to apply and receive a research fellowship to model cartilage malformations with tissue engineering. Who is it? And of course, not going into sports medicine. <laughs> Given my passion for global medicine and background in biomechanics, a lot of biomechanics, my ideal residency program would enable me to continue pursuing these interests. Additionally, I am seeking a program committed to underserved communities with opportunities to teaching and mentorship. There you are. You remembered, that was good. Uh, I am eager to begin my training in orthopedic surgery with a, pro a program that shares my enthusiasm and passion for learning. I look forward to learning, sharing, and advancing orthopedic knowledge as one of your residents. Uh, through my exploration in medical school, I confirmed my initial inclination that a career in orthopedics would challenge me, allow me to solve complex problems, and enable me to see a concrete end product in my healed patients. There you are. And last, I believe that my calm under pressure enables me to tackle any problem, work effectively with any team, and communicate well with patients. I also take pride in my ability to grasp concepts. There you go. Do you remember that one? And this is the last typical one. For me, the championship is being an excellent orthopedic surgeon all of my professional life. I'm a team player. I'm determined to prove. <laughs> so you only get one memorable one out of the eight. And here it is. I swung a hammer, framing houses, turned a wrench, building bicycles. I have a forklift on loading docks and use a drill to mount ski bindings. And most recently, for five years prior to medical school, I found myself on the nozzle of a fire hose running into burning buildings when others were running out. I mean, you just kicked ass on that one. <laughs> I mean, that, that is by far the most memorable personal statement. Uh, here's a, another book that you should consider. It's called Who Moved My Cheese? And if you don't change, you can become extinct. Uh, change is what we have to do. We have to evolve if we're in this education business. The parting shot is education does not end at any point in our lives. It's an ongoing journey to be carried with us every day throughout our lives. Special thanks to you guys for inviting me. Uh, Michael Goldberg was my chairman in or orthopedics uh, many moons ago. Uh, and uh, he taught us a lot of things. He taught us uh, about um, taking care of patients. He taught us about being outstanding doctors and, and surgeons. Uh, Rick Matson has been a, uh, a unofficial mentor. I talk about mentorship a lot. You don't have to have mentors that are just from your residency and fellowship. Uh, you may come across people from other parts of the country. Uh, Connor and I have a long relationship back to 2005, 2006, when he came as a Doris Duke fellow in between his third and fourth year of medical school. Uh, and I think he taught me as much as I taught him. And Lisa has become a really good friend through the AOA. Again, another way that we can meet people from different specialties through the organizations. And Howard, thanks very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, so congratulations to you guys. Uh, this is an incredible uh, journey that you've been on, and this part of it is a, a really important step in your uh, future careers, and it's been a, a pleasure. I hope that this uh, talk gave you some food for thought. Uh, those are my two daughters. Sonia, as you mentioned, Cody is gonna take her MCAT in seven days and counting, and Claire is 13. Thanks very much for your attention. Brent. Can you expand on your one month of uh, ortho boot camp and the surgical training that's involved? Yeah, so the, um, they do one week of each of those um, four uh, skills. So they do an arthroscopy week, they do a fracture week, they do um, uh, basic orthopedic skills week with casting and splinting and reductions, et cetera. And that's all run by one of the PG-5. Uh, so each PG-5 resident is given a different administrative responsibility for the year. There are two administrative chiefs, but the other four also get a specific thing to do so that they don't check out. 
Uh, we found that out a long time ago. Uh, and then uh, our, our program director and associate program director oversee that entire month. And that's at what stage again? Right now, it happens right when they start, yeah. So their internship is one month short? short. Yeah. Okay. Any other, Dr. Clavino? Yeah, I think I think that's a I think that's a, a really critical problem. Um, mentorship, in its truest sense, uh, is about familiarity and it's about comfort with the person. So the mentor-mentee model does not really blend lend itself nicely to the I'm going to be at the hospital X and Monday I'm going to be doing trauma, and Tuesday I'm doing foot and ankle, and Wednesday I'm doing hip and knee, and Thursday, and that happens, we understand that. But the places that have tried to maintain a, a hybrid uh, of sorts, where you still maintain the mentorship component, uh, I think still do better job with that, because ultimately, as you know, if you're with me for, even if it's for three weeks, but you were together every day, by the end of the three weeks, I would anticipate that you've really learned how, exactly how we do things and you're gonna progressively increase. If you're with me every three months for one day and you're like, hi, and I'm just like, what's your name again? Uh, that does not breed uh, the giving of the sharp, dangerous stuff to you. So I think it's an ongoing challenge, but it's the reality of healthcare with new hospitals going out into the community, residents going to lots of different places. So uh, I think that's gonna be more and more of a challenge. You know, Mayo has uh, always uh, prided itself on the on kind of the mentor model, uh, and they're struggling with trying to figure that out as well, but continue to, to maintain that that's the best way to do surgical education. Bill, any questions? Yes. Thank you. I have a question for you about the metaphor that you're using having to do with millennials. To what degree do you really find those generational metaphors helpful? I, I don't think there was a thing that you listed that was slammed on millennials that I didn't hear from my faculty when I was a resident, and I'm not a millennial. And I don't think there was a characterization you made about millennials that I don't identify with in terms of how I like to learn or how I like mm. to learn. I think it's a good, it's a, Seth, it's a really good question. Uh, I do think that there are significant differences, though, in the way people learn and uh, were taught from other generations to this generation. So I think those are real differences because that seems to be the crux of where most of the conflict arises. So that's why I emphasize so strongly to my faculty and to everyone I can that just understanding how someone learns and that that might be different than the way you learned and that that might be different than the way we did residency, it doesn't make us right them wrong or vice versa. It just means it's changed. And so I do think, so, you're right, a lot of the things are, of course, you know, we've heard that every, every generation that, you know, we worked harder than they did, all that. So some of that I think is, but I do think that the learning part as well as the digital part is in the, and kind of the interactivity part uh, is different because they had they were exposed to so much more. I mean, just think about my 13-year-old daughter, um, you know, playing on the computer at age three, um, very with fa with facility. Uh, is you know, that's kind of crazy, but that's the world that they live in and, and grow up in. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so advanced uh, practice professionals, APPs, uh, nurse practitioners, nurses, MAs, ATCs, um, RNs, uh, you know, we've, uh, in, the, in the short time I've been chair, our department size is now 405 people. Uh, I've hired 23 faculty, I've hired uh, 14 athletic trainers, a number of nurse practitioners, RNs, et cetera. So that's, that's the other part of this, is that as medicine has gotten more complex, and the EHR is really at the, at the root of that part of it, we've had to outsource some of the things that either we were doing as the doctor or residents might have been doing as the doctor. But we need to make sure that we're doing the doctoring part. And uh, we can't do the doctoring part in this modern era without that support. We're in the midst of the $1 billion epic transition at, at New York Presbyterian over 10, camp, 10 hospitals. Uh, we go live January 2020. It's got everybody crazy. Uh, it's going to be a disaster, at least for a short period of time. But part of that is scribes um, and s allowing the doctors to hopefully not decrease productivity because of this new change to a new you know, uh, electronic health record. So it's just the it's part of of modern medicine uh, is that that EHR kind of uh, I think mandates that you have a lot of other support so that we can just pay attention to taking care of patients. I'm curious, how do you use the athletic trainers? Our athletic trainers, um, it, it's part of our sports medicine program, and so when I was negotiating to be chair, we talked about the import of ATCs. They are the by far other than medical assistants but of all the other APPs, they are the most cost effective and probably the best uh, because their knowledge of musculoskeletal health is far super superior to every other one. You have to train a nurse practitioner, an RN, uh, MA uh, into orthopedics. You don't have to train an ATC. Uh, so we use them in various roles. We've done 50-50 roles where we will go to a high school and provide, the, they'll work for the high school 50% and then work with us 50%. Uh, and then many of them we've just hired you know, within the sports medicine uh, faculty's practice. So I have an ATC, an RN, and a nurse practitioner as part of my team. Um, and uh, all, almost every, every sports medicine person in our department, both the non-operatives and the operatives, have an ATC as part of their team. There was a hand that went back up there somewhere. Oh, Dr. Hanel. Thank you.